For reasons that utterly escape everyone involved, you're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. Here are your hosts, Gabe Howard and Michelle Hammer. You're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. My name is Gabe, and I have bipolar disorder. I'm Michelle, and I'm schizophrenic. Michelle, you and I, we just, we just, we just own it. We own it. We own it. I, Gabe Howard, bipolar. Michelle Hammer, schizophrenic. And that, that's it. That's it. So I, I think we have completed the episode on how to tell people that you have mental illness. There you go. Just be like, hi, hello. This is me. I have this. Hello. How you doing? Goodbye. That's that's it. So if you had major depression, it would be. Hi, I, I'm Michelle. I have major depression. I'm Gabe and I have major depression. I'm Michelle and I have uh, uh, ADD. <laughs> I love how you were thinking of all of the different mental disorders. And you're like, which one do I want to jokingly claim that I have? I feel like maybe there was some stigma in there. Like some other ones popped in first and you were like, oh, hell no. Uh-uh, no. I can see you having some OCD, but like instead of wanting everything neat, you want everything to be like completely deranged. Well, my room is a mess, but I know where I keep my stuff. Usually it's when other people clean up my stuff. The, where I don't know any, don't know where anything is. It's very frustrating. Don't touch my stuff. I know where it is. It looks like a mess, but there's a method to my madness here. I promise. There's no method. You throw everything on the floor, so you know that everything is on the floor. But in the position of where it is, I once had an issue with the pharmacy. They were saying that I, I couldn't get my medicine. I got it three days after, and I found the receipts on my floor. Good thing I didn't throw those receipts out. And I brought those receipts in and showed them their mistake and I, yelled at them and reported them to the corporate office. I completely agree that you have ADD <laughs> because we've just been talking about your housekeeping skills for the last three and a half hours. We'll edit it down to like two minutes. Fine. Michelle, a lot of people aren't in our position. They're, they're not public or vocal about living with mental illness a lot of people they just they're just living regular lives they want to be left alone they don't want to announce to the world that they have bipolar and schizophrenia they don't have podcasts they don't give speeches they don't write they're just leading a quiet normal life and there's nothing wrong with that because that's what they want to do but they still have cause to tell people they have mental illness not on the public scale that we do but person to person, you know, they want their spouse to know or a potential date to know or they needed to tell their parents or their friends or maybe they need to disclose at work. And this creates this this problem. Yes, the problem of when to tell, how to tell, how what is the right way to tell. And of course, what is the wrong way to tell? Yeah, what is the wrong way to tell? I, I can honestly tell you that that swinging from a chandelier screaming I'm mentally ill. That is the wrong way to tell people. I would say also the wrong way to tell people would be like if you are on the way to the hospital to be sent to the psych ward, you probably shouldn't call up your your partner and be like, hey, by the way, I'm schizophrenic and I'm going to the psych ward right now because I tried to kill myself. Okay, see you later. Bye. Well, that's an interesting point that you bring up, because if you really are on your way to the psychiatric hospital, if you really did just self-harm and you've never told your romantic partner, your friend, etc., then unfortunately, even though that's the worst time to tell somebody, it's still better than not telling them at all. So I, I really think that the message is, is the best time to tell people is when you're doing well. Absolutely. But how soon is too soon? This is the million dollar question. How late is too late? Yeah. I mean, I think that question is worth at least a half a million dollars. <laughs> As you know, I'm married. I'm I'm married to Kendall. She's my third wife. My first wife I never told because I was an untreated bipolar and we never knew I had it. My second wife told me that I had bipolar disorder, so that was convenient. But my, my third wife, I knew that I had bipolar disorder. I was living well, and I was, I was looking for a long-term relationship. I was looking to date. And I dated a few people before I got married, before you know the right one came along. And I had this idea in my head that the third date was the right date to tell. I don't know why I came up with that plan, but it was always the third date. Except for Kendall. Why? I don't know. I told Kendall via text message before we ever met. Well, I 
I guess it went well then. I mean, it, it worked out. She didn't ghost you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she wasn't like, new phone, who dis? <laughs> I often wonder, though, if like I started off chatting with like one of her other friends and <laughs> they were like, oh, hell no. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Just ch- change your name to Kendall and you can have this guy. <laughs> her name is actually Mary Beth. <laughs> Just some, just some bitty that's that is in the living room with a different name. Lied to you the entire time. Yeah. The but the reason that I say this is because it just goes to show you the best laid plans. Honestly, the reason that I told her via text message is because I I had just had yet another bad experience. Not really tied to living with bipolar disorder. Just you, you know, I I I had a a couple of bad dates with somebody, and it, I was just like, you know, I I don't really want to date. But I had been emailing back and forth, and I, I don't believe in ghosting people. I, I think that's wrong. So I was just kind of trying to sabotage it. I thought if I sent a text message and said, hey, I live with bipolar disorder, that she would ghost me. Or, you know, it would just kind of fizzle out from there. But that didn't happen. I guess she liked you, Gabe. I She was willing to have a date with me. I mean, the, uh, I, I, I guess this did not deter her from having a first date. Maybe you're just so suave. Rico. You're that suave bipolar suave. guy. Oh, that text message suave texting. The thing is, is I, I don't, I'm never going to get the opportunity to try it again. I mean, should I like, for science purposes, should I open up an account on like OkCupid and just start sending, hey, I'm bipolar text no, messages? No, you know, the, the No Longer Lonely site. Uh, remember that site? I do remember that site. Yes. Are you No Longer Lonely, Michelle? Yes, I'm no longer lonely. Aww. Aww. Now, how did you tell your significant other that you were a whack job? Sorry, I'm schizophrenic. In my most recent relationship on one of the first dates, I was shown um, that my partner had an eating disorder tattoo. So right out in the front, I was told eating disorder. So on like second date, I was like, hey, watch this video I was featured in. And I showed the WebMD video where I was featured in and showed all about my schizophrenia. And we watched that, and then I was asked, why did you just show me that? I was like, really? Okay, guess it's not that big a deal then. I would say the relationship before that, where I was like two years in, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to start a company called Schizophrenic NYC because I'm schizophrenic. And he was kind of like, you're not schizophrenic. I go, no, I am. Um, no, you're not. No, no, yes, I am. No, you're not. No, yes, I am. He's like, what? Okay. And that was it. You dated someone for two years and didn't tell them that you lived with severe and persistent mental illness? Yeah. I also want to say that for two years he didn't notice. He was not that into you. <laughs> I was not that into him either. This is awesome. That's, that's like that's the greatest relationship. I like what you said there about, because this is happening more and more, the eating disorder tattoo. There's lots of people that have all kinds of tattoos to symbolize living with mental illness. There's obviously the most popular one, which is the Project Semicolon tattoo. Just a little semicolon that people get tattooed all over oh, the yeah. body that shows that they live with mental illness or that they support somebody who does. There's obviously my bipolar symbol that, that a lot of people are getting tattooed on their bodies, which I think is fantastic. I'm, I'm, it really makes me feel really good. But there's all kinds of other stuff that people get, the green ribbon, sayings, et cetera. So people really are just kind of wearing it on their sleeve yeah, or under it. Or under their sleeve. It's becoming way more accepted. And I think especially among the younger generation, all of the people with these tattoos are closer to your age than they are mine. I suppose, yes. Yeah. And Marie Otis has a uh, semicolon tattoo. And it's not just tattoos. I mean, a tattoo is, you know, like a lifelong art on your body, but there's clothing that signifies this. You know, for example, I have the bipolar shirt. You have schizophrenic.nyc, which sells clothing we have the Define Normal shirt, which starts a conversation about mental health. So it's, it, it is becoming, I, I mean, I don't know that 20 years ago, somebody would have put on a shirt that said bipolar or schizophrenic NYC. Maybe the Define Normal one, because that's a little, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's easier to swallow maybe. Maybe. But, you know, we also have, you know, the pins and the stickers. And I know that we see it everywhere because, of course, we attend, you know, just a, a boatload of mental health conferences. We really do. But I like that it's getting out there more. Definitely. Michelle wants a new microphone, so we got a sponsor. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. 
secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash psych central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. Betterhelp.com forward slash psych central. And we are back. So, Michelle, let's play devil's advocate for a moment. Yes. Pretend that you are not the great Michelle. You are not living with schizophrenia openly. You don't have your own podcast. You don't have an award-winning clothing line. You've never spoken to thousands of people before in your life. You're just sitting at home living with schizophrenia. You meet a new friend. It's not romantic in any way. You just meet a new friend. Mm -hmm. It's a co-worker at work. And you're just you're just hanging out one day. You've known it, it's, it's, it's a she- and and you've known each other for like a month and you can tell that you're all besties. You like the same types of ice creams, the same types of movies, and you both are annoyed by the same types of politics. So you probably want to share deeper parts of your life with this budding BFF. That's true, but it's a coworker. That's an excellent point, Michelle. I take that back. By coworker, I meant volunteer coworker. You're yeah. you're hanging out, beautifying the local temple. You mean I can't show the WebMD video? Right, because you don't have any of this. So if I want to just share, just share that I have schizophrenia? Yeah, and remember, you're not you're not Michelle in, in, in this. You're just you're just a regular person. You you've lived your life, you got a great job, a nice apartment, and you're volunteering on the weekends for your synagogue. And that's how you met your budding BFF. I I think I would just you know what? I don't know if I would share it. I don't really know. I think I would wait a longer time. Like I, how long? Um really depends how close we are. This is kind of a hard question to answer. Do I really want to share it? I'd be nervous that they would judge me differently or how just how close is our relationship? If we were super close and I knew there was going to be no judgment whatsoever, I would just share the information because the person knows me for me. If I felt a little uncomfortable, if I felt like the person judged other people all the time, then I wouldn't share it at all. I would have to notice how that other person judges other people when we're around do they you know do they gossip a lot do they talk bad about people i really have to gauge the other person's personality to really decide if i'm comfortable telling them and what if i tell them and then they go and tell tons of other people behind my back in a snarky mean way or in are they going to keep my secret in a nice way or if they feel that i should tell more people you, you've raised so many excellent points. And these are the problems that people in our community have. Because let's say, you, like you brought up the coworker at work and you're like, look, I don't know if I want to risk it because I don't want people at work to find out because I could lose my job, which would be my, my support, my money, my health insurance. And, and that's not necessarily worth the risk, even for a friend. And many people in our community just feel that way. But let's move off of that for a moment and touch on what you said about Maybe I just wouldn't tell them. Maybe that's not something I want them to know. Isn't that a bummer? Because there's a part of you, a big part of you, that you're afraid to share with somebody. And that, that's, that, that's got to suck. That, that, I mean, I don't know why I said that's got to suck. That does suck. Just when you're looking at somebody and saying, you know, I want to be your friend and I like you, but I don't know if I can trust you. But I still want to be your friend. How do you resolve that in your mind? I'm not sure that I can trust you with this thing that's important to me, but I still want to be your friend, fully acknowledging that I don't think I trust you because if I share this part of me, you will be mean to me. But I want I still want to be friends with me and you. I'm, it's yeah. hard. It's <laughs> it's not it's not an easy thing, but I would have to say just from my experience of talking to people at my pop up shop, as soon as I say that I have schizophrenia, they say to me either they have a mental illness, a friend has a mental illness. Or a family has a family member has a mental illness. So if I even do share that with this person, you're this you know theoretical person, it's more likely that they're going to actually connect with me in some way. I would think. And that's what I want to put out for people to understand. There is a reason that you want to be friends with somebody, and you have to trust that. If you bring somebody into your home, if you bring somebody into your life, and you're spending time with them, and they make you feel good, and you like this person. You have to ask yourself, why do you not want to share this? 
let's say that it goes well. Because I'd like to believe that we're all being friends with people who are good people for us. They are good friends for us. We made them a friend for a reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're too afraid to tell them because you think that they're snarky, judgmental, or mean, or they're going to tell everybody, you might just want to rethink the friendship. Good point. We should throw that right out there. Yeah, yeah. If you're friends with a mean person, then don't be friends with that person. Yeah, yeah. If the person's a dick, move on. Yeah. So now, yeah, later. So now you've told the person you're you're going to connect on this meaningful level. You sit the person down. We're going to say over coffee. I don't know why. It's always over coffee. It's probably because you're from New York. So it was coffee or pizza. I went for coffee. And you say, random friend that I met while helping out at the synagogue. I live with schizophrenia. And that person says to you, the only thing that every single person ever says when you tell them that you have a mental illness is, that's funny. No, you don't. Yeah. Now, what do you say? I would say, no, I really do. Take seven medications a day. It's how I live my life. I have it. You don't have to believe me, but I have it. So what, what I always say when people think that I'm being funny is, is I say, I, I completely understand why you think I'm being funny because we have this idea in our head of what people with mental illness look like. And I, I know that I don't look like that. But I really do have bipolar disorder and I'm living quite well. I'm living so well that nobody believes me, which is a testament to how well I am doing. And there's hundreds of thousands of Gabes out there that are just living their life and nobody knows that they're mentally ill because, of course, crisis is public and wellness is private. Exactly. I've been with people where they'd be like, well, they've been like, so if you didn't know that Michelle had schizophrenia, would you have been able to guess? And they've been like, no. But really what I think when they say no is that they just haven't spent enough time with me. I go back and forth on this one, Michelle, because on one hand, you do have a couple of tells. You, you do kind of mumble to yourself. You kind of talk to yourself. You you do some stuff. But I, I don't know. I don't know that I would think schizophrenia because, again, people think that people with schizophrenia are drooling, rocking back and forth. They've got this very unfortunate stereotype. And you are incredibly articulate and you are smart and you are accomplished and achieved so I might just think you were weird. <laughs> I, I think I would, before I would guess mental illness, I would probably just think, wow, that chick odd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. That. And, and I've, I've certainly, you know, unfortunately, and th- this is nothing that our listeners don't already know. People think that people with schizophrenia are like the most violent of the mentally ill. And uh, you, you have no violence in you. I mean, none. The most violent I've ever seen you is when you couldn't get like a pack of pretzels open on an airplane. You fought valiantly. (laughs) Dude, I don't know why pretzels are so hard to open. It's because your hands are so small and you're weak. (laughs) My hands are not even small. I have gigantic hands. That's true. Man hands. I'm like man hands. Yeah, exactly. I have man hands. That's so mean. You know, many people in our community, they they, they gripe. You know, they're, they're listening to this right now and they're thinking, wait a minute. So on top of being sick, I'm now the appointed spokesperson for whatever illness I have because I have to teach the people all around me about my own illness. Like they couldn't just know. Why couldn't I get like the hiccups? People already stand understand the hiccups. I could just be like, I have the hiccups. And people are like, yeah, I understand. But no, I've got to pick an illness that when I tell them that I have the illness, they're like, what's that? And then I have to teach them. Well, that sucks. Yeah. But yeah, it does suck. But that's where we are right now. That's why more and more people need to talk about it so everyone can understand what mental illness really is and what it entails. That is very, very true. And if you think about it, there's a lot of illnesses that are this way. It's not just mental illness. There are no end to the number of diseases and illnesses and maladies that happen to people. And whenever something medical happens to somebody, people have questions. You know, my father had to have heart surgery a few years ago. I know what a heart is and I know what heart surgery is. I had a ton of questions. My dad's like, I have to have heart surgery. Wait, why? What's your blood pressure? What are you doing? Are they going to use a pig valve? Actually, I think it turned out to be a cow valve. Why are we putting cows in my father? And when it gets hot, is it going to smell like hamburger? Just Does he milk now? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> dad milk. <laughs> but so we, we do tend to believe that people in our community, people are living with mental illness, that the reason that we're being asked is because it's a mental illness and because it's so stigmatized and discriminated against. But the reality is, is I think people just have questions about illnesses that they don't have because they don't understand. And asking these questions is proof that they want to get to know you. 
It's proof that, they want to understand. That's true. And sometimes my friends will get annoyed when I go delusional and I look to the side and I start smiling and talking to myself and they go, hey, hey, who are you talking to? Why are you smiling? What was just going on? And I just like, I'm like, oh, nothing, nothing. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. It's embarrassing. I don't want to say. And they're like, then they get mad because they're like, no, what was so funny? What were you thinking about? Tell me, tell me. But I, but I don't want to say because it's, it's embarrassing that I just got caught talking to myself. And then I don't want to talk about it. But then people think that I that I'm hiding something from them and they don't like it. So I'm kind of stuck in a and I don't know what to do. Do I tell them the ridiculous thing I was thinking about, which really isn't all that interesting. It would just took me out of reality. Or I mean, do I not tell them or do I tell them? I don't even know what what's is there a right answer there? I don't no, know. There actually. Yes. I stand corrected, Michelle. You heard it here first. Gabe Howard was initially wrong. Yes, there is a right answer. The right answer is whatever you want it to be because it's your life and they need to respect your boundaries. I'm not saying be rude to your friends or call them names, but you need to let them know, you know, look, when when stuff like this happens, this is how I want to handle it. Still to this very day, when I have a really bad panic attack, I want to be alone. I don't want my wife to sit with me and rub my back. I don't want people to come in and give me a hug and tell me they love me. When I have a really bad panic attack, I want to sit in a room and I want to be left alone. And when I'm well and I'm not having a panic attack, I set that expectation among all of my family. Other people are different. I talk to other people. They're like, when I have a panic attack, my wife brings me water and she hugs me and she loves me. And I'm like, hey, that's fantastic. That's that's not what I want. Until, of course, it is. Because sometimes I do want that. So. You, you know, people are welcome to change their minds. You don't have to share your delusions with your friends if you don't want to, but you do need to tell them what's going on. You can't just shut them out or they're not going to want to hang out with you because they're going to be like, we don't know what's going on with her. I get that, but that's not really an answer to my question, Gabe. There is no wrong way to eat a Reese's. <laughs> and you should educate the people around you about what makes you happy and what you need. But is there a right way or is there a wrong way? The only right way is what works for you and what works for your group of friends. Because if they're unwilling to do that, you know, maybe they're not the right friend group. And I think that if we're honest with our friends, if we're honest with our family and we explain why we need this and how this is beneficial and what's going on and why it's important, I think that reasonable people will be supportive of what we need. I think that we have a tendency as as, as traumatized people living with a really shitty illness to kind of scream demands at people and nobody responds to that screaming leave me alone i'm depressed that that doesn't make people want to leave you alone that makes no. people want to scream back that makes people want to help you because they they think you're going through a really rough time right they don't know when they can trust you and when they can't they don't know when to step in or when to give you space and that's why communication is so important and that's how come when you want to be bffs with somebody you should probably tell them about your illness or not I mean, I had best friends that already knew I was schizophrenic before I found out I was schizophrenic. I think everybody knew you were schizophrenic. I, I think, like, you're on your birth certificate, it's schizophrenic Michelle Hammer. Um, I don't think so. In NYC? No, no, no. That's how you got the domain. No, name. I seriously, I told them, and they were like, yeah, that couldn't have been more obvious. <laughs> they seriously said that to me. They're like, yeah, yeah. Like, there's nothing more obvious you could have said to us right now. We thought that's what you had the whole time. And then one of my friends, they're like, yeah, we, we even told you that. And I was like, you did? And they'd be like, do you remember us like yelling like, who are you talking to all the time? And I was like, well, sometimes I was on the phone. They're like, well, how many times were you not on the phone? And I was like, I was just working things out. Just, just, I was just working situations out. And they're like, no, you, you were talking to somebody that wasn't there. And I was like, well, I guess that would have been a big red flag, I guess. Yeah. Maybe a giant red flag. Yeah. I guess that was a big red flag. And I guess I should have known that sooner, I guess. Okay. Maybe it was more obvious than I thought it was. But listen how defensive that you were. And this yeah. does make it harder to work with our friends and family because our friends and family have spotted that something's going on. And you're like, no, it's not. You're being mean to me. You're defending yourself. You've got your back raised and you're like ready to fight. And all they're trying to do is help you. And in many cases, as we know, this devolves into just hurt feelings, arguments, and nobody getting along. Now, I know, you know, people are going to say, hey, listen, really, you want the sick person to be the reasonable one in the room? 
it, yeah, it, it's rough. It, it, it's hard to advocate for yourself because you're both sick, the expert, and you've got to like teach everybody and be an advocate. It's a real big pain in the ass. But this is what we're left with. So, you know, tell your family, hey, you know, I'm going through a lot. Maybe you could chill. Maybe you could forgive me for the times that I was defensive and angry. As you pointed out, I was sick. Maybe cut me some slack. And I think that sometimes this works. This is how I made up with my family. I was like, yeah, I know a lot of shitty things got said. But as you pointed out, I was sick. And they're like, that's a good point. We did know you were sick. And they were stressed out, too. Come to think of it, it's all their fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here. That's the takeaway. Our family's messed up. Yes. 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 Our family's made us mentally ill. <gasps> no, that is like one of those myths that just will not end. Nature versus nurture. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, it is always great hanging out with you. Listen, if you've got somebody to tell, rip the Band-Aid off. That is the best advice that Gabe Howard has for you. I think that Michelle will agree. I do agree. Just be confident in who you are. And if you're going to tell somebody, be proud of yourself. Don't put yourself down. And if you are, the more confident you are, the more the person will accept you. That's true. And the more they'll understand. And remember, if somebody asks a lot of questions or they're scared... It shows how much they care about you. That often gets misread as anger, distrust, and it makes people defensive. Don't. People should be curious about what's going on because chances are they don't understand. And if you're honest with yourself, when you were first diagnosed, you had a lot of questions too, and you didn't understand either. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this episode of A Bipolar, A Schizophrenic, and A Podcast. Remember, you can go to store.psychcentral.com and grab the Define Normal shirt. It's literally the best shirt that we sell. So please go ahead and grab it over at store.psychcentral.com. Go to iTunes, Google, Stitcher, Play, or Spotify. Leave us a whole mess of stars and write a review. It really helps. Finally, share us on social media. Comment on psychcentral.com slash BSP. And make us famous. We will see everybody next week. Be brave. You've been listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. If you love this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Head over to iTunes or your preferred podcast app to subscribe, rate, and review. To work with Gabe, go to GabeHoward.com. To work with Michelle, go to Schizophrenic.nyc. For free mental health resources and online support groups, head over to PsychCentral.com. The show's official website is psychcentral.com slash BSP. You can email us at show at psychcentral.com. Thank you for listening and share widely.